please be seated. Of course, I have no affinity at all for today's gospel. <laughs> Some of you haven't been around here long enough to know that you all picked me up by the roadside. Now notice that Jesus didn't say, come over here and kneel before me and I shall be your savior. Didn't say that. In this rendition of the miracle, different from some of the other gospels, he didn't say go wash in the pool of Siloam. He said, go your way, go your way. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Let's be Baptists for a minute. Say that with me. Your faith has saved you. Because that's addressed not just to him 2,000 years ago, that's addressed to you and to me right here, right now. Your faith has saved you. I don't know what it is that brought you into this church this morning. I don't know what it is that brought you into this church for the first time. What brought me into this church for the first time was friends of mine were coming here. And I wanted to come to be supportive of them. Right? Right? I still remember the first time I was sitting right over there. I had never heard the collect for purity before. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets hid. I wanted to jump up and say, wait a minute. Hold that thought. I need to go think about that. I'll be back in about mm, six weeks. <laughs> then we can go on. No, I was just, it blew me away. Your faith has saved you. Your faith is saving you now. Because it is your faith that reaches out and touches God and reaches out and is touched by God so that your life is in the process of being transformed from an ordinary human life and an ordinary universe in a world and a cosmos that doesn't frankly care whether you or I live or die. Transformed into a divine life in which we receive God's love and his transforming power in which this life in which we live right now is only the beginning. It's a life preparing us for eternity. An eternity that we can dream about and imagine about, but don't really know about. Okay? I mean, I think it's going to be pretty cool, but I have no idea what it's really going to be like. It's your faith that saves you. Yeah, does Jesus do it? Yeah. Does he do it by the power of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Is it called to by the Father? Absolutely. It is your faith. That is the vehicle, that is the umbilical cord through which God nurtures and loves you and draws you into the development that will prepare you for life in eternity. That's what draws you here. That's what draws you to this table. You are being prepared to be in the future what Jesus Christ is now. We've all been sitting by the roadside, blind. And I can't help but think that Jesus, you know, that the tone of voice was more like, so hey, what do you want from me? <laughs> what can I do for you? that I can see. Oh, you want to see? There you go. But it's your faith 
that has saved you. And faith is reaching out beyond that which you know will actually work for you. Because there are times, aren't there, your life and in mine, when we just, we, we don't know if we can go on. We don't think we can go on. We're just, all we can do is sit and wait for something that comes from outside of ourselves. But truthfully, what Jesus says is, what you're waiting for comes from inside of you. God has already implanted that faith within you. You have but to nurture it and reach out with it. That's what will take you beyond that which seems insurmountable. Bartimaeus was sitting there, he was blind. You know, what was he going to do? It was insurmountable. I don't know what you're facing or will face that is insurmountable, but I know it's something and I know it will be something insurmountable. And it's your faith. It's reaching out in faith. It's daring to reach out in faith. That's what will bring about your transformation and your salvation. You know, uh, I, I wish I was Joan or Mike Gerhardt or somebody like that who could, who could write their sermons down so I could remember what stories I've told you guys. <laughs> you know, and what stories I haven't. And I can't frankly remember whether I've told you this one. So if I did, I'm sorry. Just, just you know, suck it up and think of something else. But, <laughs> but when I was a kid, I, um, I lived across the street from a schoolyard. And we were on a huge hill. The property was all... The hill was like 12 blocks long, and it was huge, big incline. And the schoolyard in which we played literally was cut out of the side of the hill. There was a mountain of the stone wall that was at least three stories tall with a fence and barbed wire on top of it, right? And the schoolyard was down in the, in, in the pit, right? And it was a nice schoolyard with the stuff that schoolyards had. Well, so if you can imagine, there was a schoolyard. There was a, the, the road went this way, right? I forget, I can't tell you the angle, but it was steep. And then it flattened out up here on the top. Big fence, right? Well, you know kids, you reached a certain age, and when you wanted to go out and go down to the, um, to the candy store where you could get a soda, box candy, you didn't walk out the gate and walk up the sidewalk and go that way. That was just what, you know, when you reached a certain age, that's what the wussies did, okay? That's, that's, that's what the kids you didn't want to play with did, right? What you did was, you got yourself on the inside of the fence, on the wall, which was about that wide, and you walked up sideways holding on to the fence, till you got about three stories high. And then you turned, and you walked along the fence, and there was a barbed wire up there. You couldn't go through it, but there was a chimney where they used to burn the trash. And if you climbed up by the chimney, there was no barbed wire over the chimney. So you could put your little behind on the thing, swing around, and drop down at street level, and then go do your thing, right? That's what real boys did and real girls did, right? Well, I got to be a certain age. And so, of course, I was called upon mostly non-verbally, to do this rite of passage. Except I only see out of one eye. That means I don't have any depth perception. 
I could get up to the top. I could shimmy across the side. I couldn't get myself to climb up the fence and go over by the chimney. Couldn't do it. I was terrified. I mean, wet your pants terrified. And of course, the other kids were very helpful the way other kids do. They all went over the other side and stood there with their nose against the fence going, look, Wendy can't do it. Okay? We, we all know how helpful our friends are at a certain age. Well, there was this one day, I, I would have to then go back down and go all the way around and know that by the time I got to the candy store, they were all going to be standing there and ha everybody had something to say, right? I had no faith in my ability to go over. I had no faith in my ability to conquer my fear. I had no faith at all that I could be like any of them. Till this one day. And this one day I get up there by the chimney, right? And I'm holding on to the fence, right? And I can't go forward. I can't. But on this particular day, I'm not going back. I can't go forward. But I won't go back. And there I was. All by myself. Not knowing what to do. And I closed my eyes and I was in tears. Trying really hard not to wet my pants. Quite literally. And I remember saying a little prayer. I don't remember what it was. And then a funny thing happened. I'm hanging on this fence, right? I can't go forward, I won't go back. Can't go forward, won't go back. Hanging on the fence, I say a little prayer, and all of a sudden, in my mind's eye, my eyes are closed now, it's like, whoop! The, the scene goes back, and I can see myself from a great distance hanging on this fence, right? And I can't go forward, and I won't go back. And I'm just saying, oh, Lord, help me. I don't know what to do. I can't go forward. I won't go back. I'm terrified. And what happens is, in my mind's eye, all of a sudden, I see myself hanging there, only it's not me as I am anymore. It's a little skeleton. Right? A little skeleton hanging there on the fence, right, in my clothes. <laughs> You know, because apparently I've been there for some time now. <laughs> you know, and now I really can't go forward. I really can't go back. And everything that I see is in black and white. Because, you know, when you're a kid, and maybe when you're even not so much of a kid, these things come to look as if they're in black and white. There's one thing that isn't in black and white. I'm wearing a baseball cap. I'm wearing a baseball cap. Now my father was the coach of the champion little league team that I couldn't play on because of my disability, because of my blindness. My grandmother had shamed him into giving me a purple hat. That was a team hat. It was my prized possession. And that was the only thing in my mind's eye that was in color. And there's the little, the little skeleton hanging there, right? Can't go forward. Won't go back. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I get this impulse. And I throw my hat over the fence into the middle of the street. 
and now I'm going over. Because I ain't leaving that sucker there to get picked up by some big kid or run over by a car. Now I'm going over. You understand? And so I did, for the first and only time in my life, climb over that blankety-blank-blank fence, retrieve my hat, and go and get my Coca-Cola. It was my faith that saved me. Just like it's your faith that will save you. Every time you find yourself in a place where you can't go forward, but you won't go back anymore. Bartimaeus had no way to go forward, but he wasn't going away either. When you can't go forward, and you won't go back, pray that your faith tells you to throw your hat over the fence. Because it's your faith that will save you. It's my faith that saves me. Say that with me. It's my faith that saves me.